Welcome everyone. Hello everyone. Thanks for joining us. Unfortunately, we picked an odd time and day to do this. I think some people weren't able to make it, so they did ask us to record. So we will be recording this J term program. And I just want to welcome everyone to our Duquesne University J term on how to make a homemade pasta, which is brought to you by the Offices of Student Conduct and Center for Global Engagement. I'm Annie Malarkey Sawa. I am the Director of Student Conduct, and I promise that no one participating is in trouble, nor will you be in trouble. Um, our goal today is to have fun, to learn a new skill and talk about our Center for Global Program. So again, thanks for coming. And we have several people helping us put this program on today. One being Ms. Megan Evangelist, who is an Assistant Director of International Admissions. She has very graciously allowed us to use her beautifully renovated kitchen where our chef will be demonstrating today. And a very fun fact about Megan, this totally shocked me, was that Megan has traveled to, wait for it, over 35 different countries. So what a lucky, lucky woman. Hopefully we'll hear about some of those adventures today. And our chef who is joining us today is Aaron Morelli. He is a manager of international admissions and recruitment, new to Duquesne, just having joined us about three months ago, right, Aaron? Excellent. Aaron studied the culinary arts in many cooking classes throughout his travels in Europe and while he was living in Southeast Asia. And with a strong Italian heritage, Aaron has learned many culinary secrets from his grandma and has been cooking with his family since he could hold a spoon. So join Aaron as he walks us through this technique for handmade pasta and classic marinara sauce. Thank you, Aaron, for being here. And finally, for those of you who may have attended our Duquesne in Rome program, we have a very special person. And that is Elena Sacraponte, who's our ex assistant director of Rome. We're so excited that she's joining us today virtually. Um, and Elena has lived in Rome for the last 14 years. And really, she's a perfect example of the opportunities that open up in our students' lives when they take advantage of the opportunity to study abroad. They may fall in love with another culture, another country, make friendships and relationships across the world, develop new skills, and so, so much more. So we're really thrilled, Elena, that you're here with us today all the way from Rome, and hopefully you'll get to see um, some other friends who have studied abroad as well. So I wish I could say, let's cook, but unfortunately, I do not speak Italian, and I'm not even going to try it. So maybe Elena, you can help kick us off. By For sure, we can cuciniamo. Let's start cooking with Chef Aaron and Megan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Elena. Um, so today, just to at what our agenda is, uh, we're going to be making a very simple marinara sauce. And again, we're starting with the basics for marinara and also for pasta. But then we're going to make two types of pasta, one with kind of regular flour and another with semolina flour. Um, and we'll go through the dough making process, how to roll them out, and how to make these doughs themselves. Um, and with that being said, let's get started. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do, we're going to talk about our marinara ingredients. Um, these are what you see on the internet really often as the most popular tomatoes to use for Italian marinaras. Uh, and this is a San Marzano tomato. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe these are from the Naples region. Um, and these are pretty special just because um, you can cook these um, and they have a lot less um, seeds than a typical tomato. Um, they also have a thicker flesh. So if you can see on the second camera we got here, um, these are the full canned tomatoes and they're taken out completely of the can. Um, you're seeing there's less um, seeds inside of here. The flesh is pretty thick. Um, it also has a really soft skin, so they're easy to peel. Um, but these ones you get in the can, um, they already have the skins peeled off for you. 
And this is usually the best way to buy your tomatoes. If you don't have a fresh um, garden in your backyard or you don't have access to fresh ingredients, canning them is a very, very great way to preserve that freshness, the tartness. Um, and they're just a really, really great um, tomato to start with when you're cooking any types of sauce. Um, and a similar tomato that you might see in American grocery stores are Roma tomatoes. You're just kind of looking for these like longer plum size shape. Um, and the first step of making this marinara is actually a pretty easy and fun one. Um, I'm gonna get Megan to help us out. So we have two 28 ounce cans of tomatoes in here. And I'm wearing a fancy new white coat that I got for Christmas uh, about two years ago. Um, I'll tell you guys a little story in a little bit about my dad, but um, we're going to completely squeeze all of these, mush them up, use your hands. Um, making pasta and Italian cooking is all about getting your hands dirty. So I'm gonna hand this over to Megan, where she is going to just squish them until the consistency you want your sauce. <laughs> Um, while, while you're while you're doing that, I just wanted to say that those San Marzano tomatoes are legally the only tomatoes that you're allowed to use for um, for Italian Neapolitan style pizza. They have to follow legal laws, and and those are the only authorized tomatoes that if you're claiming your pizzas from Naples, you're only allowed to use those tomatoes because well, they're the best one. So. Sure. That's so interesting, Elena. Yeah, wow. Um, so the next ingredient that we have is four cloves of garlic. Um, a lot of this is flexible. I really keep the amount of tomatoes the same, but we're using fresh basil and we'll be using some fresh garlic. Um, I love tons and tons and tons of garlic. Um, so when a recipe calls for just a couple, I usually add a lot more than that. Um, but I'm going to show you a quick, easy way to kind of peel your garlic. Um, most people will go in with their knife and just smash it. This is a really fast way to get rid of the garlic shell and the skin on it. Um, but today uh, I'm showing you a little bit of a different way um, to thinly slice the garlic. This really keeps the flavor intact. And instead of blending into the sauce, you really get a difference with a garlic punch and a tomato punch and basil. It's a really nice experience, but Go ahead, you're totally able to just mix it up, like chop it up, throw it in how you're used to cooking with garlic. Um, but I've noticed the thin, thin slices are a really good way to like enhance that garlic flavor. Um, just a quick little knife safety. Um, when you're holding your knife, you do not want to grab it just by the handle. Um, this is a really unsafe way to hold the knife and you don't have really good control. Um, you wanna be able to hold the knife completely with your pointer and thumb finger. Um, so that you are really in the center of the knife and you have full control. So if you go like this, it's really easy to slip and cut yourself. Um, but if you're holding the blade at the base, this is a lot safer and it really helps with that rock motion as you're cutting. Um, and you'll see garlic often too. Sometimes it'll come purple, sometimes it'll come a little white. I'm actually not sure exactly the difference between these um, two garlics. Um, but instead of smashing these today, we're just going to cut off the very end, kind of the butt of the garlic with our knife. And from that, you'll see you're able to peel off at least a little bit that's like right on the knife. So you're seeing the garlic clove is already coming, like the peel is already coming off. Um, and from that, you can kind of squeeze the clove and the shell itself, or the skin itself, will usually just pop off pretty easily. Um, so the recipe called for four. I'm going to add five. I really like a lot of garlic, but today we're just going over the very basic, simple marinara, um, and you really can do whatever you like. Um, but while I chop these up, I'm going to ask Megan to uh, wash her hands maybe because <laughs> um, you'll see this is the kind of consistency we have for the tomato. I'm going to grab the other camera real quick. Um, so you'll see this has some chunks in it still, but this is a pretty, pretty smooth tomato sauce already. Um, again, there's different ways to make this even more smooth. If you really don't want any tomato chunks in your pasta or in your marinara. Um, but if you like it chunky, you can leave it a little bit bigger. 
Um, so this is a really good stage to keep the tomatoes at. Um, and while I'm getting the garlic ready, um, you want to make sure you're using a pan that has some good weight to it, because this is going to simmer on the stove for about one hour uncovered. Um, so you want to have a little bit of height in the pan as well. Um, just seeing the size of the tomatoes we're putting into this, um, you don't want this to splash around and get the whole kitchen messy. So make sure you have enough room in the pot. Um, but Megan, could you put about a quarter cup of olive oil? Um, this is more than you're probably used to cooking with. Um, again, this is Italian cuisine. Olive oil is a very, very big part of Italian cuisine. Um, and I even add a little bit more than that. So this is where we are in the pan. Um, keep going. And I'd say that's just about right. Um, feel free to adjust this to change how much you want, but you do want a really good olive oil flavor. Um, and you'll notice today we're using some fancy olive oil. Um, I don't know if you can see on it, but this is a cold pressed olive oil. Um, and the quality of ingredients here, especially with this marinara, is very important. Um, that's why we really are choosing these very specific tomatoes. We're using fresh basil, big cloves of garlic, um, and a really nice olive oil. Because if you have just a few ingredients, um, they're really going to shine and you want the quality to be up. There's not much room to mask it with seasonings or spices. Uh, this is all about the ingredients today. Um, and cold pressed is actually the least refined version of olive oil, um, where most olive oils will either use heat or chemicals to separate the oil from the olive itself. Where cold pressed is the old fashioned way, how everyone used to make it, how you're still able to make a lot of oils today, where they keep the temperature down low and slow enough that the friction doesn't generate as much heat. And you're left with a much smoother, a really rich flavor in the olive oil. Um, but the one tip I actually learned last night um, when I was cooking these stuff, you want to make sure you have a pressed date um, without it. And I actually can't find it on this bottle. Um, without a pressed date, you really don't know how old the olive oil is. Um, so you might be buying olive oil that was grown in Italy, shipped somewhere in the United States, repressed or redone and ends up in your grocery store. Um, and if it doesn't have a pressed date, you really won't know how old the olive oil you're working with. We have some marinara already made and it tastes pretty fine. So I think we're <laughs> safe here. Um, but that's really an important step when you're in the grocery store looking for this. Um, and I need to cut up the garlic really quick. Sure. So do you mind just putting this on a really low temperature sure. so we can get the olive oil ready? Absolutely. And whenever you're cutting, make sure, again, you're holding the knife with both of your fingers. You're in control of the knife. And then you want to make sure your fingers are curled. This is going to prevent you from chopping your fingers off. It is a really important thing. Cooking is so much about knife skills. So this is an important step not to skip. And you're just going to chop as thin as you can get on this garlic clove. Again, don't be fussy. You do not have to be perfect here. This is just going into the marinara. And we just want to make sure that we're able to taste the garlic separately at the end of the dish. But you'll see as I'm like slowly moving my fingers back, I'm able to rub against my fingernails and instead of like my soft fingers. So you want to make sure you're doing this so you don't have any accidents, especially if you're cooking, showing a cooking glove. <laughs> um, but again, Chef, Chef Aaron, um, you were saying about purple and uh, white garlic. Uh, purple garlic, they're they're very similar, but the purple garlic is actually it's not as strong as the white garlic. So if someone, I guess, prefers a more subtle, uh, subtle tasting. Um, you know, garlic flavor in their marinara, they could use that, um, or they could just use less of the white, but they're pretty much the same. Oh, thank you for that. I actually did not know that. My mom always used to buy elephant garlic, which is these like giant bulbs. You can get them some giant eagles. Uh, I'll typically go there, but uh, I went to our little Italian pasta store right in Pittsburgh, where we'll go through some other ingredients for the pasta ingredients. 
Um, but they have a really, really good selection. I just got some garlic cloves from them because I figured if any place in Pittsburgh has the right groceries for Italian cooking, it's the uh, Pen Mac and the Strip. Um, but now we have the olive oil heating up a little bit. You don't have to really heat this up in advance. Um, garlic can be very fussy. So you wanna make sure that you do not burn this. This is the only mistake that you can make while making this sauce is burning the garlic too early. Um, so it's always safe to go with a very, very low temperature. Um, if you're thinking it's getting too hot, add more olive oil. That's a really good trick to take the temperature down. Um, if you're seeing the olive oil really sizzle too quickly or start to brown. Um, but we're gonna cook this until it's a little bit fragrant. And this is a secret I didn't actually learn from my grandma, but this is a secret that if you really Google what the, your secret ingredient is in marinara sauce, um, you're going to see that they are anchovies, which kind of sound a little bit gross. Um, but the one thing that I see a lot of people have a misconception about <laughs> is that uh, anchovies are the same as sardines. Sardines are the ones that look like little minnows. Um, anchovies are not like that. Uh, we're going to add this to the sauce so that you really get that deep flavor, the umami, the kind of funk that everyone loves about Caesar salad dressing. Um, but by adding it into a tomato sauce, or really this can go in your lasagnas, your chilies, this pairs very, very well with any kind of tomato acidic sauce, um, where these anchovies are gonna break up. You don't even have to tell the person you're cooking unless they're vegan or have dietary restrictions that you even put the anchovies in them. You cannot really notice the taste, um, aside from the complementary flavors that it really helps melt together. And especially when we only have a few ingredients, this is a really, really fun um, way to add some secret sauce that your friends are going to ask you about. Um, but I'm just going to add one anchovy. So you'll see it's not the full fish that you're used to. Uh, and again, this is optional if you're really too afraid and you don't want to try it. Um, that can be up to you. But I'd say at least for once, anchovies are pretty inexpensive. Um, try one of these anchovies, see how you like it. It's not going to ruin the whole dish. Um, and I'm just going to put this directly into the pan. Um, the heat, your spoon, mixing this, this is all really going to break everything up. Um, so I'm just going to turn the heat up a little bit more. Um, there we go. So we got some heat going. Uh, we're going to wait for this to sizzle. Uh, and again, this is a pretty forgiving process if you have the temperature down low. We don't have to have this hot yet. Um, this is just really to kind of cook the heat that is inside raw garlic out and make sure that you're left with the flavor and the oil and make sure it's all infused. Um, so I'm just going to stir this a little bit. Maybe. Do you mind showing the my cooking? So I just want them to see how easily the anchovy will break up. So the garlic, you'll see it's not really cooking yet. Um, we're still waiting for it to heat up. But you can use your spoon to just break up this anchovy. And you'll see a lot of this just kind of fall into the oil and disperse completely. Um, so we're just going to, again, wait for that to heat up a little bit more. And while that's ready, we're gonna get some of the basil prepared. Um, so this is some fresh basil I got from our store. We're in the middle of winter, so it's a little difficult to get fresh basil everywhere. Um, but I really recommend you at least use some fresh or if you can get those tubes in the grocery store that have like the prepared basil. Um, this is something you do not wanna use dry basil for. We have only a couple ingredients, so you really need the strength of each of them. Um, but this has already been rinsed off, and I'm just going to uh, peel off all of the leaves because we're actually going to eat a lot of those. They'll be mixed into the sauce. Um, but a fun little tip is the basil stem. Usually throw these away, um, but just like bay leaves, um, this is really good to keep in the pasta, uh, keep in the marinara as it's cooking. And then we can just pull out the basil stem afterwards but we're really after a very strong basil flavor. 
I'm obsessed with basil. I love tomatoes, olive oil, garlic. This is my favorite sauce. Um, so I like to add as much as I can. Um, I know we've called for just one sprig, but I'm actually gonna add a little bit more. Um, again, I love basil. One of my biggest mottos in the kitchen is don't be fussy. Um, so if you're really making sure that all of your things are cut prepared like perfectly and you have everything totally neat, uh, this is not the kind of recipe for you. Um, but we do have the two, I might do a little bit more. And we're just leaving these whole leaves. We're not gonna cut them up because um, basil will wilt pretty quickly. Um, so we just have these prepared over here. And Megan's thrown on the camera to show what our olive oil, garlic, and anchovies looking like. Um, so you'll see, you can smell it a little bit right now um, with the anchovies a little stronger. But again, there's this giant thing of tomatoes this is going into and a lot, a lot of garlic. Um, and this is just gonna really break up um, pretty easily when it heats up, when you have it in the oil, um, into just like little tiny bits. So if you have someone that you know is very fish sensitive or they really don't like this taste, um, make sure you get these a little bit smaller. Um, but this honestly is about good. This will continue to break down a little. And the garlic is sizzling a little bit too quickly for my liking. Um, and we're about to add basil. So I turned the temperature down, but I'm actually gonna add a little of the regular olive oil and that will bring the temperature right back down. So you can control it with the flame underneath, but you can also control it with room temperature ingredients. Um, just make sure you never add water to hot oil. That is a very, very big mistake you wanna avoid. Um, but now we're looking pretty good. So I'm just gonna throw the basil in. Uh, be careful with this step. Basil has liquid in it. Um, so you're throwing this into hot oil you really want to make sure this doesn't pop up. Um, make sure you're covered or have something to prevent it from really hurting you. Uh, I'm just going to toss that in. This isn't reacting that highly, so this is a good temperature for us. But this step is really only just a little bit. Um, we still want the texture of the basil in the final sauce. Um, so make sure you're not, I don't know, just overworking it. And now is the time to add the tomatoes. Megan, would you mind doing this? Sure. This can be very, very splashy, so uh, just be careful. Okay, we're pretty good here. Because um, again, you're adding different temperatures together. Um, you're working over a flame, so make sure you're doing it um, pretty well. Erin, is that because you have a white chef's jacket on? <laughs> yes. Um, so this is actually, I'm, I'm not a professional chef. I do love to cook. I spend a lot of my time cooking, taking classes. Um, but my nickname growing up was Moose. Um, and this, so my name is really Chef Moose. Um, and my dad knew about this and he surprised me one Christmas with a custom embroidered chef suit with this hat with my nickname on it. Um, and I used to, I did a video when I was about 10 or 12, um, where we made a video of chefs around the world, where we did a cooking class, um, showing some different things with my older brother. And we were just kids working with like a old VHS. Um, but it was really fun and I really love this. So I'm glad I have an opportunity to use the coat. But now that we've got the basil, the tomato, garlic, anchovy, and olive oil, we're just gonna add some salt and pepper. Um, pepper, definitely to taste. Um, some people don't have that much of a tolerance for pepper, but um, I like to add a pretty good amount. Uh, just make sure you're cracking this fresh. If you don't have fresh cracked, that's fine. But again, with few ingredients, the quality and freshness is really, really important. So just about that. Um, pepper is very flexible. Salt you want to be a little careful with. Um, canned tomatoes already contain a good amount of salt, um, but it's always a safe spot just to add some to make sure you're mellowing all the ingredients together. And the garlic and the anchovy and basil didn't have any. So really just a couple squinches, or <laughs> a little bits of them. 
Um, Cause we can come back and really adjust this later. Um, but that is it for the marinara. It is a very, very simple sauce. Um, so we're going to bring this up to a simmer, uh, make sure everything's hot enough. And then this is going to go simmer for a full hour without a lid. Um, we really want the sauce to reduce um, because if you're cooking the tomatoes longer, they really break down and their sugars come out of the tomato. So that's what really creates that sweetness in a sauce. Um, but again, this is the basic, basic marinara. Some recipes will call for shallots or onions. Um, that adds some really good flavor. I like to start that way. Um, if you really like some heat, throw in some fresh spicy peppers, um, but you can do some red chili flakes. I know those are really, really common. Almost everyone has them, but feel free to experiment with different herbs and spices, different vegetables. This is just a really good basic sauce um, that you can keep up into your fridge for, I think, at least a week. Um, and in your freezer, this will last a couple months. Um, so this is just something to good to have on hand almost all the time if you're making anything Italian or anything that might require some stewed tomatoes. Um, this is just a really, really good way. But again, I'm gonna bring this up to a simmer, make sure we're good there. Oh, and I also forgot, throw in the basil stems. Um, this adds more flavor. It's not a necessary step, but you bought some fresh basil, let's get some good use out of it. And we're going to let this simmer for a full hour. So Megan, can you keep an eye on this and make sure it doesn't like spoil sure. over? Sure, sure. And while we're doing that, we're actually gonna switch to our two pastas. Um, let's... First, we're gonna talk about the ingredients. Oh, actually, would you want to say anything? Sure. Sure. Um, we're gonna switch the camera now because we have a little bit bigger working area for here um, while we're doing all of this pasta. If you don't have a really big kitchen counter, your dining room table is pretty good to use. Um, we've also seen people use like big chunks of wood. You can pull out your drawers. Sometimes this adds a really good extra layer of space and extra working room. Um, if you don't have that big of a kitchen, Luckily, we're here today with Megan, where we do have this space, uh, but we're just going to jump over to the other side. And one second. While you're, while you're doing that, um, I thought I would just share that it's really interesting that, you know, in Italy, the idea of the, the pasta with this marinara sauce, it's, it's, it's the most common dish that people eat included in the Mediterranean diet but it's, it's the least commonly ordered pasta at a restaurant. And that's only because everyone's mother and grandmother and even the kids, it's, it's almost a staple thing that you need to learn and what families eat at home as their, as their meal. Um, so it's also the fact that you can make something so delicious like Aaron was saying, with such few ingredients, right? They're also inexpensive ingredients that families can um, can buy. And so it's very interesting because a lot of times tourists want to always order that at a restaurant when they come here. And, and many restaurants have that as an option, but it's it's not commonly ordered whenever you um, when you go out to eat. So just kind of a fun, fun little fact. Elena, what is something that people would order at a restaurant that's you know more prevalent well i obviously we're in rome and so rome is famous for having um really it's uh i would say like the the top three pasta dishes that are ordered are are the roman pasta dishes uh one which is called cacio e pepe which is black pepper and cheese which is kind of the basic again like our mac and cheese but a little bit different um and then we also have an amatriciana which is a red sauce um that has a little bit of a kick to it with um has little chunks of meat inside guanciale which is the cheek meat so that's a little bit more intense and then the carbonara which has egg um and pepper and again the uh guanciale meat in it as well so they're very rich pastas and a little more elaborate to make. And so that's, I would say, one of the top of our things to order uh, at the restaurant. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks. 
And we love your shirt that you have on representing the Center for International Duping. Yep. For our, okay. our study abroad and international students. Um, this is uh, definitely this cooking class is a great um, uh, a great thing to do. And it's also something when our Duquesne students come to Rome, we do cooking classes, we go on excursions as a part of the program where they learn about food and the Mediterranean diet. Um, and so this is really great to have a piece of this um, also for everybody stateside. Awesome, thank you. Okay. Thank you guys for the little stories. Um, actually, I think Can everybody hear me okay? We can hear you, but we can't see you. Now? Now we can't, yeah. Okay, um, so we're making two types of pastas today. Um, one of them is going to be with um, just your typical pasta flour. I know this isn't very typical, so uh, I'm going to kind of show you where to find these um, in Pittsburgh and maybe where you're living. Um, so you'll see this is called double zero pasta flour. Um, the double zero is doppio zero for um, the really, really fine grain of this flour. Um, this really helps keep the, the pasta a little bit more silky um, since it's so soft and finely ground. Um, this also really helps um, get a, a little bit more of a chewier pasta. Because um, if you've never had fresh pasta, uh, the taste is a little bit different. The texture is really where you're noticing that. Um, this has not been dried. This is a really um, kind of authentic experience of pasta. Um, but you'll see it looks exactly like all purpose. Um, and I'd say if this is your first time making pasta and you don't want to spend any money, um, try it with all purpose. It definitely works. Um, all purpose is just kind of your general pasta. Um, double zero is very specific for pasta. Um, and if you go to the Pennsylvania Macaroni Company, is that the name? Yes. <laughs> the Pennsylvania Macaroni Company, um, they sold this giant tub for $6. Uh, so this is a quick investment, so you have enough flour. And you can use this in your other ingredients. This doesn't just have to be your pasta flour. Um, but you'll see, this is made with the typical wheat, what you're used to seeing in all purpose. Um, but we also have semolina flour. Um, they sell in the same bulk containers, um, so it's really good. Uh, what I noticed though is semolina is more available in your larger chain grocery stores. Um, so you'll see this in like a giant eagle if you're familiar with Pittsburgh, um, Trader Joe's, a lot of boots, like a lot of big stores will carry semolina because um, this is used in a lot of breads as well as pasta. Um, but this is a little bit chunkier, and you'll see it's a little bit more golden. Um, the difference between these two, one is actually the plant that they're made from. Um, this is the typical wheat that you see in almost all flowers and used in a lot of cultures. But the semolina flower, this is made with what's called durum wheat, which is a little bit more dip, a little bit harder than regular wheat, um, where this only uses a portion of the, the whole grain. Um, in addition to this, but the real difference you'll see between semolina and maybe whole grain pasta flour or whole grain flour, um, is that this is a different plant. Um, so this we're going to be using for some braided pasta today. And then we're going to be using the double zero flour for just your typical linguine, fettuccine, whatever kind of pasta you're making. This is good for lasagna, just your typical egg pasta. Um, so we're actually going to get started with the regular flour pasta. Um, this takes a little bit more time um, because regular pasta flour has low starch, low gluten, and low protein. Um, so it's really about building the gluten in this. And gluten, I know everyone's familiar with gluten-free diets today, uh, but gluten is actually a protein that you develop while working this dough. Um, so a lot of wheat dishes will have a lot of gluten. That's why you see it in breads and flour. Um, but this has a low natural gluten where we'll be working and really kneading this dough for longer than you want to. Um, but trust me, it's totally worth it. Um, this, you really have to build the gluten so you get that um, noodle that keeps its shape after you boil. Um, for semolina, you'll see we're just going to mix this with water form a dough ball and let that sit. Um, this already has a lot of gluten, so the more you work it, the tougher the noodle will get. 
Um, so we're just going to hold off on semolina. And one thing I would tell everyone to invest in is a really cheap kitchen scale. These are not expensive. I know growing up in America, we grew up with cups, ounces, teaspoons, and all of that. I still find that way too complicated. If you have a scale, you can measure your weight and it's a lot easier. Um, and we really have to be careful about where you're cooking um, because if you're in a higher elevation, your, your flour might be less compact compared to another elevation. So if you're just using a typical um, like dry measuring cup, you will probably get different amounts if you're not weighing it. Because you see flour can get caked down and pushed down where weighing it is a lot uh, more accurate, especially again, we're using simple ingredients. So measurements and um, the quality of the ingredients are really important. But I've gone ahead and already measured. Um, I, we recommend about 100 grams per person of flour. Um, and the rule of thumb is 100 grams, one egg. Um, so I've measured out about 300 grams. Um, and just for your reference, uh, 100 grams of flour is equal to, they usually say like a hefty three quarters cup. Um, again, it's really, really difficult and subjective. So um, it's not necessary to measure it um, with the scale if you don't have one. Um, you'll learn quickly if your pasta needs more liquid or if they need more egg. Um, so it's safe to start out, but if you're really trying to be consistent, weighing is the way to go. And then with this, the only moisture that's coming in here is from these eggs. Um, so again, quality is really important. If you can support your local farmers, get some Amish eggs, get some farm fresh eggs. Um, this, again, when it's so few ingredients, it's really, really important. Um, and one last ingredient, you want to have your, you want your pasta have a little bit of flavor. So just add just like a sprinkle of salt. Um, and some um, professionals will really sift their flour dough, be very, very particular about this, or some will even use a mixture of double zero flour and semolina. Um, but that's really up to you how you prepare your pasta. We're just doing the basic basic basics today. This is just going to be uh, one flour, one pasta, one flour, one pasta. Um, so you're going to get messy. Don't worry about this. Everything you're making today is very hands on. Um, so I'm going to dump all the flour onto the table. And a handy, handy tool is, I always forget the name of this. It's like a, a pasta cutting knife uh, or like a dough knife. Um, this is a pretty sharp surface. So you're able to scoop and clean your surface very, very easily. Um, this is going to be helpful when we're getting into the messy part of the dough. But a quick little trick is to use your bowl and then you create the um, little pocket in your pasta dish. And Megan, can you hand me a fork? Sure. We're actually going to whisk this a little inside of here. Um, but we're cooking live with you guys today. So um, Megan off camera has been um, stirring the marinara sauce. Uh, again, it's uncovered. You want to have a pretty low simmer. Um, you just want to make sure you're not, uh, you really can't overcook this. Once you're past the garlic, there's no way to mess this up. Uh, so just keep it on a low temperature and let it simmer for the full hour while you're preparing everything else. Um, but we have, again, 300 grams, 100 grams is one egg. So I have three eggs here. And don't worry too much if you feel like your pasta is too dry, if you don't have, if your eggs were small, if they're too large, um, you're always able to adjust this with adding a little bit more flour or adding a little bit of water. Um, this is a pretty forgiving um, method. I mean, I don't know how many cultures make pastas, but this is not just Italians. Everywhere around the world makes a different type of dough and pastas. Um, but you're seeing, I'm just using the fork to whisk, whisk and make this all mixed. Um, this isn't even a necessary step. I like to keep my fingers kind of clean. I'm a, I'm a pretty picky cooker, um, but you can use this fork to kind of slowly bring in some of this flour. And we're looking for something that's a little bit closer to a dough. I mean, here we're very too liquid. So I'm gonna keep working a lot of this in um, slowly. And making pasta takes time. 
Um, so this is really about effort, continuing it, and just working at it. And Elena, what's the most common pasta that you'd say you eat? Is it usually like an egg dough or I don't know, what do you eat in Italy? Well, the, the egg dough, the pasta, pasta fresca or pasta luovo, the egg, egg pasta, I would say is not as common. Um, a lot of people at home, obviously, um, they, they buy both and they also make it. But um, I, I would say the m most common um, short pasta would be maybe um, there's the fusilli or the corkscrew or the farfalle or the bow ties, which are really butterflies for us, they call them. Um, and then the long pasta spaghetti or bucatini. The, the difference is, is there's so many more rules here about what you're allowed, to, what, what kind of condiment or sauce that you eat with the type of pasta. I, for the maybe first 10 years, well, maybe even until now, I sometimes still make the error and I will say, well, we can just have this with, uh, you know, whatever else. And my husband says, ah, oh, this is a, this is not allowed, you know, or this right. doesn't follow the rules. Um, so they're very particular because it's really all about the, the, the texture, the consistency, um, how the pasta shape will hold the sauce. So, you know, whether it's something that has the nooks in the crannies that will be able to have a lot of a heavier sauce and keep that on there. So it's really, really fascinating how many different kinds, kinds there are. Thank you. Thank you. I just brought this up so you guys can kind of see the dough a little bit more closely. Um, so right now, this is about a good stage where you're seeing it kind of get a little thick, looks a little bit like a dough. Um, but again, you don't have to be fussy. This is a pretty easy, forgiving recipe. Um, but I like to clean off the fork with the pastry cutter. And then really, I'm just going to mix a lot of this in from the sides. I like to do a lot of this process without my hands in the beginning, because this is getting, this is a lot of dough um, and still very, very liquid or very, very moist at this stage. Um, so you just want to kind of mix everything in together. You don't have to be fussy about getting every little piece. Again, we're, we're working this dough for minimum five to seven minutes, depending on how strong you are and how much effort you're really pushing into the dough. Um, this can take longer or shorter. So don't worry if you're not getting all the flour on the side. We really just want to kind of incorporate it as much as we can until you start seeing, if you watch in cooking shows, kind of what like a, like a pie dough will look like. You start to see the different um, dry chunks of the dough. But again, this knife is really helpful. You can be using your hands for this entire process. And that's where I'm actually going to switch right now. Um, so you can grab this. Uh, you really just want to spread out the moisture. And I am definitely American Italian, not Italian American. So please don't hate on my pasta kneading skills or my dough kneading skills. It's really however you feel comfortable. You're going to get your hands really, really dirty, but really don't worry. You have the trust in the dough. This is going to um, get itself out, work itself into the dough. And you can already see I'm starting to form kind of a little bit of a ball. Just make sure you're scooping up all the extra bits. You wanna break it in. And this is the dough again, it takes a lot of time. Um, so you wanna make sure if you're chopping any pieces, you pick them up, you can pop it right back in. Um, and it's gonna feel like this is way too dry. Like how is this gonna turn into a pasta dough? Um, don't worry about it. It's all going to work itself out. And if you want, at sometimes you can kind of clean up the board, make sure you're getting all of the little chunks in here. You're going to incorporate this into the dough, but we're looking for a very smooth elastic dough at the end. Um, pasta dough is very, very smooth. It's well incorporated um, because we're going to be spreading this out very, very flat and you need everything to be pretty consistent. So again, if you have stuff on your finger, it's falling off, don't worry. 
this is a fun time to get your family or friends to help you with because um, pasta is all well, food is all about bringing people together um, and my family actually we didn't cook much fresh pasta going up um, our thing was gnocchi uh, that was the one dish that my great grandma used to make um, we used the leftover mashed potatoes because um, my great grandmother was an immigrant from Rocopia, Italy. It's a southern chunk of Italy. And I actually don't know too much about it. Elena, do you know much about Rock Rocopia or Rocopia? Did you say that's near the Naples area? I believe so. I think. Um, okay. Oh, Megan actually has a map up there. It's above <laughs> the boot. Because I think it's closer to the heel. It's a mountainous area. Oh, I'm looking. It's in Abruzzo, so it's actually very much. Um, we're in Rome. We're in the Lazio region. There, there's 20 regions of Italy, so the Lazio and Abruzzo, where you're saying, is kind of they start to consider that the center or towards the south. Um, definitely, I think Abruzzo is one of the. Well, every region says they're the best region, but Abruzzo definitely um, is a winner in terms of culinary. Um, not so much high, highfalutin as they would say, but really down home, down, like down home cooking, if I can say that. It's very mountainous. There's lots of um, little small towns, probably like Rocca Pia. That's super cool you're from there. Oh uh, yeah. So my, I think my great grandma, so her family name is from Zalia and my great grandfather's family name is Clemente. And my last name is actually Morelli. Uh, I really don't know much about my uh, that heritage. My uh, I never met my real grandfather, but we have a lot of Italian on both sides of the family. But I think I'm a fourth generation Italian in America, um, so I really don't classify myself too much as America as Italian. Um, I really like to cook tons of cuisines, but this is really what we grew up with. Um, but this is what the dough is looking at right now. You're going to see a lot of these tears in the dough. It looks like it's still kind of getting mixed together. I'd say we're only about a third of the way done here. Um, I'll get out some pasta dough that we already made so you can see what it looks like. Um, I'm actually going to get Megan to continue some of this. Um, I'm going to wash my hands really quick. Sure. Um, just keep kneading that um, using both hands. Kneading is pretty flexible, so you're able to do it however you want. This is all about not being fussy. You don't have to be too particular. Um, you just want to make sure that you're mixing the dough evenly. Um, some things to avoid. Uh, if you're seeing that you're folding the dough a lot, you're going to create a lot of issues in the dough. Um, so try to just like rotate this a little. Um, you're not folding this like you would a pastry dough. Um, that's really going to create a lot of layers. This is all about keeping it pretty consistent. Um, so you can use one hand, you see a lot of people will go in kind of like pottery. So you push away from yourself with both hands and then you like keep going and you can twist the dough a little bit, uh, but you're really just trying to avoid extra, extra layers. But Megan, we're going to go on that for a couple more minutes. Um, this is some dough I prepared in advance. This is a really easy step. If you don't have that much time to make fresh pasta, you can do this in advance. But you'll see some of the, like the flesh of the dough is a lot smoother. And you really, a good tip is to pinch it. And this might not be coming back too much since I made it earlier. Um, the dough will start to bounce back. But we're looking for a fully, really well incorporated pasta dough. And we're actually going to roll this out in a little bit uh, to have to prepare the other dough that we're going to make. Um, so as Megan continues working on that, and make sure whenever you're done with your doughs, you're always keeping them covered in plastic wrap. We have a moist um, kitchen towel that works too. Um, you just don't want the outside of the dough to dry. It really creates some inconsistencies. It'll be a little tough to chew, not so tasty. Again, I'm just mixing the marinara sauce so we're not burning anything or the bottoms don't get too dark. And 
you're going to jump into the semolina flower. Um, so this is where I usually recommend people start. Um, I know this is still a pretty simple process, but kneading it to the right amount um, can be a little more difficult for a super beginner. Um, so this is what I love to do with friends and family. Um, I was living in Southeast Asia and Vietnam, and one of my favorite memories is the night I learned about this pasta and I wanted to try to make it. So I found semolina flour in Vietnam. I invited a lot of our friends over, and this is a really good group event um, because this is typically made um, now we're making lorigetas, which is a, I think, actually, Elena, can you tell a little bit more about the history of this specific braided dough? Yes, so um, so the, the lorigetas are a are traditional Sardinian pasta. Um, the name is actually in the Sardinian dialect, which is called sardo. Um, and it is, uh, Sardinia is one of our two largest islands, obviously. So it's the uh, large island off of uh, the west coast of Italy. So we have Sicily on the bottom, and then we have Sardinia on the left, which is actually its own region. Um, and they have really particular, and really interesting types of recipes and in its own separate kind of food culture. Um, so these semolina pastas that they make are very traditional and very specific to there. Um, but like anything, like how people want to get a Philly cheesesteak in Pittsburgh, it's something that also restaurants will now open up trendy restaurants even here in Rome that want to make Sardinian food and things like that. So it's something that's become, um, I would say, more uh, popular now than, than before. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm actually just going to clean this off a little bit. I don't think it matters too much. Um, this is probably one of the worst things I do is I clean too much also here. Uh, but give me one more second. Don't be fussy and I'm the one being fussy. <laughs> I also just put, um, oh, Josephine, I saw she got it. I put a little pasta uh, condiment sauce pairing guide image in the chat so people can see what usually goes with what and um, the types and their names and things like that if people want to check it out. Thank, Thank you, Elena. Thank you. That's great. Okay, so we're going to start with this dough. Again, Megan is still working on this. This is going to take a good chunk of time. Um, until you get that kind of bouncy, firm texture. Um, and it's the dough itself right now looks to be a good moisture level, uh, but just continue working at it. It's hard to mess this up, so just keep going there. But this recipe for the semolina flour, um, Lori Get This, is a little bit different. You'll find different recipes online, but um, again, you're about the same 100 grams of flour per person. But for this one, this is a flour and water dough. Um, so we're not going to be using any eggs. The moisture is just coming from the water. And then we're doing the exact same thing. Um, so this, we're just going to create the little pocket in there. Make sure that you make this big enough. Um, I made the mistake earlier where I poured way too much water in a small hole. And it overflowed. It'll break down and spread all over your kitchen. So really make sure your boat is a little, or your like moat is a little bit bigger. Um, and then the recipe for this is 300 grams of semolina flour or 180 grams of water. Um, a lot of recipes will just do two parts flour, one part water. Um, and if you really don't have a scale to measure this out accurately, um, what I used to start with is just scoop out something with whatever measuring cup or if you have a mug, scoop two flour and fill it up with water. And that's usually about the right. Again, this dough is also very forgiving. So if you don't have enough, um, you might be adding a couple drops of water or a little bit more flour. Um, but same process, we're just pouring the water instead of the eggs right into the center of the little bowl. And I won't be fussy this time. We're going to use the same pasta fork. Um, so we're just going to be slowly mixing this until it turns into kind of like a slurry. I don't know really the best way to describe this, but um, we got this video up here, so if you guys want to see a little bit more closely. Um, but this is a quick dough. Like I said earlier, semolina flour has a lot of gluten in it. 
Um, so where Megan is working at this dough to develop a lot of gluten, that's why stretching these proteins will do. Um, you do not need to do it as much for semolina flour. Um, you'll see recipes where they do um, need this dough a lot, um, but I can share a link later of where I learned this video. Um, I watch a lot of cooking TV, a lot of cooking channels. Um, Chef Steps is one of my favorite. Um, they have a really good recipe and a really good tutorial on how to make this dough. So it's pretty simple, but we're just looking kind of for this like kind of gross little milky level. And again, this is a very, very forgiving pasta. You don't have to be too fussy, uh, but I'm going to do the same thing, kind of bringing in the flour, spreading it out. I'm trying to keep my hands a little clean, so I'm going to use this tool. Um, but if you don't have one, again, feel free to use whatever you got around the house or just use your hands. Um, and you'll see this is kind of clumping a little bit differently than our regular flour dough, um, where this, since the grain is a little bit more coarse, it's a little bit larger, um, this takes some time for the water to absorb into the dough itself. Um, so at this stage, I'd say it's pretty good. Um, I'm gonna jump in with my hands and we're just gonna form a really quick dough ball. So make sure it's all incorporated. It's going to feel too wet. This is definitely a much more moist dough at this stage than the regular pasta. Um, just because this takes a little bit more time for the semolina flour to absorb the liquid. Um, so we need to give it a little bit more time. But you'll see this is starting to form kind of something I can pick up. I like to use it kind of like a sponge. Just make sure you get everything. Um, work it in a little bit. Let's pick up the little bits that are around your table. And then knead it like once or twice. You really don't need to do this one much. And then you can pour it into a little ball, but you're looking for a texture that's kind of like ripping apart still. Um, this one, again, we're not kneading it. It's a little bit more moist. It's more sticky, still pretty bouncy. Um, we're just going to let this completely stay like this. Um, but again, we're going to cover it with some plaster wrap because uh, you want it to absorb the moisture, but you don't want it to dry out. Let's get some plastic wrap. Again, a moist towel works for this. Um, you can do it all around. You can just do it on top. But we're actually going to let this sit for 15 minutes. So, Elena, if you don't mind, would you set a timer so I know how long that dough has? Sure thing. And I think we had one more person come in. I'm not sure. I don't know. I think they might have left. But now that we have both doughs prepared, because again, after Megan is done with this dough, which let me check in on that. Pretty good. Okay, you'll see this is a lot smoother. Um, the texture of this dough is still pretty bouncy. Um, you can pinch it. It's going back. I'd actually say this needs a little bit more time. Um, and again, just make sure you're folding it in a little bit every time as you go. Rotate it a little bit. Um, and this one is pretty hard to mix up, but you do want to put some work into it. Um, you really want to build up the gluten in this dough because it doesn't have the natural gluten like the semolina. Um, I'd say can maybe work on this in another like two minutes and we'll probably be good. Okay. Just keep doing this. Okay. Thank you. But we already prepared a bunch of dough in advance, so we can get started on this guy. Um, so a lot of people at this stage will have a very fancy um, pasta roller machine. Uh, I think you can pick up the manual ones pretty cheap online. Um, but we're trying to do this with the least amount of ingredients as possible, least amount of tools. Um, so this is a dough I made last night that has already rested well long enough. Um, and we're gonna start making some pasta. So as always, I like to keep like a good chunk of pasta near you. Um, so you're not always dipping back into the container. Um, it's not very sanitary if you haven't washed your hands. Um, but you want to sprinkle flour over here. And this is when you want to have a rolling pin. Um, 
you can use any kind of size. Wine bottles work sometimes if you really have nothing. Um, I think there's other hacks you can use, but really any size you want. I think this is one um, we just have lying around the house. But we're trying to roll this, this pasta dough as thin as possible. Um, a good rule of thumb for preparing pasta doughs, um, for this one specifically, is you want to be able to see through it a little bit. Um, so we're going to roll this out. So it's a pretty, pretty flat piece of pasta um, until we can like see through it a little bit. It's a little translucent. And make sure to be adding flour between some of these transitions. Um, that way you're not getting this stuck to the working surface. Uh, and just make sure you're rotating this, you're flattening it. Do like that. It picked up a little bit off of the table, so I'll add a little bit more. I'm going to turn the direction. And also because we've worked this dough so much, and there's a lot of gluten in the dough, um, this is going to shrink back. So this really pushing it back out, kind of pushing the pasta to its limits. Um, if you have, if you're lucky enough to have either a KitchenAid with a pasta arm, or if you have uh, a pasta machine, um, this step can be done really easily just by feeding it into the machine a couple times. Um, it'll go through different grades of thickness to thin out your pasta. But again, if you're making lasagna, um, this is a close taste to stop at because uh, you're looking for big sheets of pasta. Um, but we're going for some linguine, fettuccine style noodles. Um, I think it really depends on where in Italy you're from. Um, for the type of noodle and the name. Uh, Elena, do you know much about like the difference between fettuccine and linguine, the different pasta styles around Italy? Or the shapes of long pasta? Again, again, very sensitive topic, Aaron, because the, <laughs> the, all of these pastas have very specific pairings. Um, I will say this, that the fettuccine, um, you know, we don't have Alfredo here, which is something that always is such a shocker for people. It's a, Alfredo is a very Italian American dish. And um, so there's a lot of people that usually come looking for that and it's not always on, on uh, in restaurants, but, um, but the uh, linguine you'll find almost always you'll have linguine with uh, fresh fish. So um, you know, like clams, like a linguine and clams or uh, a fresh seafood pasta, um, you'll often find that. Um, but uh, you're very right about regional pastas. They have different names. Fettuccine though and linguine and spaghetti, those are all um, pastas that are throughout the entire country that you will find and they go by that name. So they, those won't change. It's more of the actually like the ones that the one that you're preparing from Sardinia, those have this, those regional names have the little special names that are specific to the place, if that makes sense. No, yeah, that definitely does. Cause I mean, I figure the longer, like I feel like this is like super common. So you kind of have the Italian standard and then the little boutique more specialty differences are cultural and that's why they kind of get those names. Exactly, exactly. Like uh, uh, we call it orecchetti or the orecchiette pasta, the little ears or whatever. Exactly. Um, you know, those are from Puglia, which is the heel of the boot. And they're only made there and they're made in a special way and they've been made for hundreds of years. And, you know, so it, like, just like you said, it's very much to attached to the cultural traditions of the people there and, and, and generations passing down how to make them and training people how to do it and things like that. Well, I actually forgot one of the steps that I'm realizing as I'm like getting this getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, I made enough dough for three people in that chunk. Um, so you usually want to separate that into a more workable surface. So I'm going to actually separate that now because this is, I'm going to show you the thickness of where this is now. Um, you, you can start to see your silhouette through it. You want to be able to see really your full, a little bit of the color of your skin to see more definition in this. So this is not done yet. I'm going to set that over here as I work this guy out a little bit more. And again, you want to be careful not to overwork um, without flipping once in a while. Uh, Cause that was getting pretty close to being stuck to the table. 
Um, so make sure you're flipping regularly. Um, but you really want this pretty thin because um, we're actually gonna do a pretty quick cutting hack so we don't have to make as much pasta or we don't have to make as many cuts. Um, we're just able to roll the pasta up. Be careful that it doesn't roll completely down your rolling pin. Um, but after we get this rolled out, and then I guess the only another difference to point out um, with fresh pasta and with um, boxed pasta or dried pasta is the cooking time. Um, we're going to boil these. We'll show you guys what the final plate looks like. Um, but the fresh pasta takes like two minutes. Uh, it's really, really fast boil because um, these haven't been hardened. They don't need to absorb a lot of liquid. Just kind of heating them up and giving them some nice texture. Um, but I know I only want a little bit larger, but this is a pretty good thickness. Um, Megan's countertop has like some marble pattern behind it. So I'm starting to see that through the front. Um, but you'll see this is a lot finer. You can see shadows underneath when you pick this up. Um, there might be like a specific measurement that you need for the pasta width, but again, we're not being fussy today. This is about tasting food that you've made, um, being pretty uh, good, oh, just enjoying the flavor of it. Um, so at this point, we're at a good thickness. Um, we're gonna be making longer noodles here. So instead of cutting all of these noodles one by one, um, I'm gonna kind of square off Adam this Adam from our office is doing a pasta cooking class, look. Hi, Joe. Uh, hi, Joe. <laughs> hi, Joe. <laughs> <You're pasta. laughs> um, so I've got kind of a rectangular, uh, just a square-ish shape. I'm not gonna be fussy. I'm gonna cut these up so that we can still eat them. Um, but at this stage, as long as you have enough flour, your dough is not going to stick to itself. Um, don't be afraid to add a little bit extra because when you throw this into the water, everything is going to rinse off and it'll be fine. But here is a really easy way just to fold up your pasta dough. And then Megan, just need to cut on yours. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then you want to just make little cuts of whatever pasta style you want. Um, so this really depends on what you're cooking, um, but you'll see since I roll it up, it unrolls into a really nice pasta dough. Um, so I'd say these are pretty thick. Um, you can go thinner, depends on your style, what you prefer. Um, you'll see handmade pastas, handmade long pastas are usually a little thicker. Um, so I'm going about maybe like a quarter inch thickness, um, but you can go really fine. Um, some of these pasta machines will actually have really, really fine thicknesses or fine um, widths for the pastas. That's where you're getting closer to angel hair or something like that. But just be a little bit quick about this because the dough will start to absorb some of the flour and the moisture in the dough will start to mix with the flour. Um, so you want to get these kind of untangled pretty quickly. So this is when you kind of just have fun, throw them around, make sure they get untangled. And we do have to let the pasta rest just a little bit. We've been working it, so we want to give it some time to relax. Um, see, like let the gluten return to its original size. Because um, we have kind of put this pasta through the ringer. Um, so once you get it pretty good, you do see people use pasta racks. Um, we're not being fussy today. Um, so you're just going to see the pasta um, we do need it to rest a little, so about 15 minutes. Um, we'll just put the pasta in a little pile. As long as it's pretty untangled, um, you're, you should be good to go. But this is a really quick way to um, make some long pasta. As soon as you get into like a flat dip, a flat um, sheet, uh, it's really easy to just cut this up. Use whatever thickness you'd like. Even with these guys, like, I'm still gonna cut this up just because I love pasta and we're gonna be eating all the sizes. So roll this one up again, maybe make some cuts. Then same thing for this guy. And you don't have to be fussy. That one's a little thick. 
Um, but same thing, we just have slightly shorter noodles. Um, a lot of people even break the pasta that they cook with, so it's totally fine. Um, and this is something that you can freeze as well. Um, we usually try to get some of the pasta to twist so it stays in a pretty good shape. Um, but after this process, um, you need to let it dry a little bit and then you can put them into your freezer. Um, and that's a really, really good way to keep some fresh pasta on hand without putting all of this work in after work on a Thursday afternoon. Um, you really want to just have all the stuff you prepare in advance done already. Um, oh, sorry. So while we're doing this, Megan finished it up. So this is a really good texture. Um, you'll see it's very, very smooth on the front of the dough um, and it bounces back. So at this stage, again, we want to make sure that this doesn't dry out. We spent all of that time adding liquid into it through the eggs. Um, we don't want it to escape. So cover this in plastic wrap. Um, really good way to just kind of ring it around, tighten it up here. Um, this can go directly into your fridge. Um, it doesn't have to, you can leave these outside. Um, but we do have some fresh egg in here. Um, we're not gonna be using this immediately because we already have some doughs prepared we'll eat today. Um, so my can I actually just throw that in the fridge? Sure. Um, but that dough again needs to rest for 30 minutes. Um, so it's pretty flexible, that one. Like the dough you just saw us make, this was from last night. Um, so very flexible dough, you don't have to like, really keep your eye on it too much. Um, but I'm just gonna finish this other guy. Actually, Megan, would you mind doing this? Sure. Um, so again, we're just making sure we have flour on both sides and we wanted to get it thin enough where you can see through a little bit. Uh, and I'll get started on the hot water. Elena, how much time do we have on the timer? You have, uh, oh my gosh, three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and I just realized that totally feels like you're my personal Alexa and I can just ask you things. Well, hey, you, you, know, you know, I am available. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> you know, I did want to tell you, though, when you were saying like no stress about cutting the pasta, something that I love, the ty a type of pasta that I love, and I'll write it in the chat here. They're called maltayati, and it actually means cut poorly or cut badly because they're just random types of different whatever comes out and obviously you never want to waste anything that you have and however they're cut and it's still pasta but um, I always think about that in terms of if you're thinking stress-free pasta making that's always a good thing if you mess up you can just tell people they're called maltayati and then everybody will be like oh so cool <laughs> fancy poorly cut pasta <laughs> No, but so this dough, I mean, you really, you can use this in lasagna. You can cut this into little ravioli sizes if you want to make tiny dumplings. Um, pasta is just dough, water, or egg, or a mixture of the both. Um, so you don't need to worry about it. Um, but Megan, actually, would you show the camera, or you can use the laptop, show what the sauce is looking like? Um, I'm not sure what time it is, but uh, We're almost coming up on an hour since we started the. Oh, wow, perfect. Uh, did you see the tomatoes on the side of the pan? Um, that's really kind of where it started. This is really reduced a lot. Um, and don't be afraid if you reduce it so much, it's really, really thick. Um, we're going to be working with fresh pasta, the pasta water. I think that's the wrong word, but it's super valuable. Um, that's one of the big tips I've learned early on and use it every time I cook pasta is your pasta water is the most valuable thing that you have when cooking. Um, it helps you refresh the pasta a lot. You can loosen the sauce, but it still keeps it uh, really creamy because of all the starch that's in the water that's really released off of the noodles that you're cooking. They almost made the same mistake again without adding flour without <laughs> starting to get stuck to the dough. Um, but this too, if you really like a thick, chunky noodle, um, feel free to leave this a little bit thicker. Um, it's just the, the fine thinness you get from a pasta machine is, I mean, it's, you're able to replicate it, but um, it takes a lot of work to get there. 
Um, I'm going to cut this one and a half this way. If I was smart, I would have rolled this into more of a rectangle, but I'm not that good at multitasking. I'm going to roll this up. And again, these cuts are quick. It's pretty simple. You don't have to be fussy. Like, what was the name about again? Malta Corta? Malta Yati. Malta Yati. <laughs> This is, a, this is the very boutique artisan pasta we're cooking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I think I forgot to mention, um, when you're making the marinara sauce, um, you really try to waste as little as possible. Um, so you'll notice the cans have a lot of the tomato residue on the inside. Um, feel free to rinse a little bit of water in there and throw that into the sauce. Um, the tomatoes we showed you earlier, they already had that water in it, um, just to make sure you're really not wasting anything. Um, the water is pretty flexible in the marinara sauce itself, because uh, we'll be adding some of the pasta water, but um, feel free to add a little bit more liquid, especially if you'd like a really runny sauce. Um, I prefer a pretty thick sauce, uh, but it's really up to you. Uh, but just try not to waste a lot of your stuff. We're not being fussy, we're just enjoying the food. But again, just breaking these guys up, uh, and then I'll set them in separate like little piles um, where they're stretched out. And these rest, feel free to leave them out like this um, for a good 15 minutes. Uh, and we actually have some of the water getting ready to boil because this is all going to come together pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so now that we have these pastas prepared, I need to make some more space. So we're going to switch over to the semolina dough. We've reached, reached that 15 minute timer. The gluten, uh, well, the flour itself has absorbed all of the water it can. Um, so this is a good point to check moisture um, and see if we need to add a little bit as we're rolling it out. And this, again, this is the Lori Lorietas. I'm sorry, my act is not that good. Uh, we kind of lost the Italian language through the generations. Um, io voglio studiare italiano. Things I want to study Italian. Bravissima. Grazie. Non c'è male. <laughs> but again, I'm giving myself some working flowers to have on the table. And this dough, you'll see, it still has that kind of rough texture, but it's a little bit bouncy. Um, so I'm just going to need it really to see where we're at moisture wise. Um, this is pretty good. I might add a little bit because you see it, it's kind of sticking to my hand if I wait a little longer. Um, that's telling me the dough is a little bit moist. So I'll add some onto the table, make sure I need to get in there. Um, and we're actually going to braid this pasta. Um, so when you're not using it, we're only going to cut off a little chunk of this, maybe about that big. Because again, this is a fun dough to use, but to make with a lot of people. Um, it is very time consuming, so I've already prepared a good bunch for us to show you what the final plate will look like. But once you have a little piece like this, uh, make sure you have a little bit of semolina flour on here. And we're just going to roll out like a little log. But this, you really need both hands. And I'm pulling and stretching at the same time. So you want to make sure that you want to get a really thin noodle. And that's by rolling all your hands. Be careful not to put too, too much pressure. Um, you'll start to see little bumps pop up in this where your fingers are squishing it. So it's helpful to like roll pretty evenly as you're going. And then when you got about this much um, of the noodle, uh, I'm going to lean into this camera so you can kind of see a little bit better. I'm going to use two fingers. You start with a slightly thinner edge. You wrap it around until it meets itself again. So then we have two rings on your finger. And then this is a little complicated to learn at first, uh, but as soon as you try it, you'll understand. Um, you're basically twisting in opposite directions. 
So once you twist a couple times in opposite directions, you get a really cute little braid. And that's all for that. Sometimes you can pinch the top where you saw the noodles connect. Uh, but this is the really, this takes time. This is like an artisan pasta. Um, and if you ever, so see here, I rolled this part too thin. Don't worry about bringing it back in and re-rolling it. Um, this is a forgiving dough. And again, you're gonna roll out another string, bring two around your finger. And this, you can vary the thickness. You'll see some of the doughs that we had um, are a little different. But this is where you really get that unique shape, makes a little braid. Um, and you continue with these. Megan, do you wanna give it a try? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I need to watch again. Show Those me. look so beautiful. They do. Thank you. So you want a slightly thinner end and a slightly thicker end. It's not that important, but um, what you're going to do is really roll in opposite directions until you get a little noodle. Once you got the string, and I find it's easier to start thicker. Um, the more difficult ones are thin, but you wrap it once, twice until it connects, or if you have a little extra, don't worry. And then peel it off your finger, rotating kind of clockwise and counterclockwise at the same time. They create a little bump. And of course, we prepared a lot extra, um, but I actually. <laughs> I didn't let the pasta dry enough. So some of them got a little bit formed as we were waiting. Uh, an important thing about fresh pasta is before storage, you really want to have them more dry. Um, so if I wasn't going to be cooking these today, after about 15 minutes, I would start to put these into the freezer in these little nests. And it's all just about the freshness. And uh, I think the pasta can stay in the freezer for I don't know, a couple months. Uh, I wouldn't go much longer than that. But as Megan continues making out some new noodles, just kidding, we already have a lot of noodles prepared. Um, we're gonna hop back to that angle. And then turn the volume on. We took some pasta. Nice, right, so big, big rule that I learned um, after watching some of Bon Appetit's videos. Um, Molly Braz is one of, or Molly Baz is one of my favorite chefs on the show. She has a lot of really good pasta tips. Um, one of them being salt the water as salty as the ocean. This is almost an uncomfortable amount of salt. So you're gonna feel gross putting it all in there. Um, it's gonna feel wrong, but you want to put a lot of salt into your water. And we're almost out of boil. I have a pretty constant argument about when it's best to add salt to the water. Um, I haven't really noticed a difference in my life. Hot, like boiling water takes some time. Um, so it doesn't really matter when you add it, but make sure that you have a lot of salt. And I'll show you about how much we're going to add. Now, can you actually have like a container of salt like we used to show? Um, and feel free to use kosher. I know that's what we said on the website, um, but any type of salt is really good for this. Um, we have a pretty big pot of water on. Uh, we're making a good amount of dough a good amount of pasta and you want to make sure that you have a lot of space for this um but i'm gonna do two palmfuls and that's like a palm full of salt that is a lot of salt and feel free to adjust this but i'm telling you even if you're making box pasta at home if you're doing mac and cheese you're draining a lot of this water out so this is your only opportunity to get flavor and really get that salt inside of the pasta Otherwise, you usually end up just eating the sauce for the uh, with the pasta. We're really making fresh pasta. We this is the star of the dish. I know the marinara is going to be delicious, but fresh pasta is just cool to tell people you made it. So this is going to be the star of the show today. And 
Another thing I forgot to mention, if you have those basil leaves, feel free to save a few of them. Um, they work really well as a nice garnish on top of the fresh pasta. Um, and I'm obsessed with basil. I could eat like an entire handful of basil with every bite. Um, so it's something really nice to add because the basil that we've added into this marinara, um, this has lost a lot of it, the flavor in the leaf itself. Uh, it's a very, I forget the like, scientific term for this, but basil, um, since it is, it's like very liquidy, I guess it's a high water content. If you cook it a long time, you lose the flavor in it and it just gets mixed into everything. Um, but this is a herb you usually want to garnish with and eat fresh. You don't want to, to mix it in right before you eat. This is really a garnish. That's how you get a lot of the aroma and the flavor. Um, but while we're waiting for the pasta to melt, or pasta, the water to boil, um, I'm just going to show you where we are sauce-wise. Um, so for the long pasta that we're making, um, the marinara is a classic pair. I mean, this is something really, really um, common to add to that pasta. Um, the Lorigetas, after we boil these, um, I'm gonna show you guys uh, just a quick way to saute them in some oil. Some butter is great. Um, if you're not a vegetarian or have dietary restrictions, um, using some animal fat is a really, really good way to bring out the flavor. Um, when I first made this, we did it with duck fat. I had a crazy connection where we were able to get like fresh tuck pretty often. Um, and frying these in a little duck fat and some onion was just the perfect way to eat them that night. Um, these are going to be great with the marinara. They're great sauteed in olive oil and garlic. Um, if you have some Parmesan, if you have any type of toppings you usually will add to your pasta, it's a great thing to add just to a little bit of oil. Um, but we're pretty good on the marinara. I'm actually going to shut that off. Um, I thought we would, we actually don't need that shit. I made a whole marinara in advance um, without the anchovy. Um, so we might do a little taste testing ourselves just to see how much the anchovy adds to the dish and how much, if it's really just kind of a myth. Um, I've really noticed it in a lot of my cooking, but um, that's the best way to learn about cooking is experiment. You eat thousands and thousands and thousands of meals in your life where if you mess one up, it's not gonna be the end of the world. As long as you like have food safety covered um, and you're being safe in the kitchen. Um, having one bad meal is not going to ruin your evening. So experiment, taste the weird things, go push yourself beyond your comfort levels and really try to get into the different cuisines, different techniques and see if other people's tricks are real or not. Um, but we're just waiting a little bit more on the um, pasta water to boil. Pretty sure I haven't forgotten anything. Um, I'm gonna grab a saute dip pan. Um, so we can get the oil ready for the Lori get this. And would you mind getting some more garlic? I think I left it in one of these bags. Um, and could you cut up some garlic for me? Sure. Just like chop it up. Mm -hmm. Do you have oven mess they could use? Mm -hmm. While I was getting ready doing that, I wanted to share that we put everyone's names who are listed in the participating group into a bowl and picked three winners that will win a gift card. And they are Alex. Josephine and Tatiana. So congratulations, I'll be in touch and um, arrangements to get your gift card to you. Yay. Congratulations. congratulations. Annie, where is the gift card to? Um, it's to grocery stores, Giant Eagle, so that rather than eat out, you can buy some ingredients and do some cooking. Congratulations. Yeah. Uh, so at this time, though, I'm going to take out the basil stem that we had earlier. Um, it's not really that great to eat. You can if you'd like, but it's not at all necessary. Um, and really, uh, one pretty uh, simple rule about fresh pastas, dumplings, or anything that you're making with a fresh dough um, is when it floats in the water, that's usually a telltale sign that it's ready to take out. 
um, you'll see immediately they're going to sink to the bottom of the pan of the pot. And then as they cook, they're going to start to float a little bit. And for being extra fancy today, I have a nice little pasta um, scooper, pasta spoon. Um, you don't have to do this. We also have a colander over there. That's pretty easy. Um, but we're going to be really dropping some of the lorigetas directly from this into some um, oil so we can fry them and get a good crispiness on it. Um, but another tip that I think my mom taught me, I'm not sure, is when you're cooking, do you have a mug? Mm -hmm. A really, really good tool when you're cooking, because again, we are going to be cooking a lot of pasta in this water. We'll get some of the starch that's in there to still stay in the water. Um, we're also going to have some of that salt in this. Um, you can dip with a mug because it's really safe to hold from here. And you can just scoop some of the pasta water before you're done cooking. Um, this is really good to use if you're doing like box pasta, even making mac and cheese out of the box. Save some of that pasta water. Um, because if your noodles get really sticky and they're a, the strainer in your sink and you can't pick them apart or it's really tough, adding the pasta water is going to reactivate all of that and it'll feel like it's fresh pasta. Um, so it's really, really smart to keep. Um, it's also great to use back into the marinara to thicken or to loosen it, but without just like watering it down. Um, and it's also really good when cooking with cheese sauces or with butters. Um, using this pasta water with all the starch will help emulsify and really kind of blend the fats and liquids together. So you get that really creamy, creamy sauce and you're not missing out on anything. But we're finally out of oil now. So again, if you added a ton of salt into this water, probably more than you're comfortable or used to using, but at least try it once. Um, this is a really, really easy way to add a lot of flavor into your pasta. Um, and then a little trick I like to do when you're throwing fresh pasta in here, especially since the noodles are kind of stuck together, um, is to give a good stir so you have moving water. Um, this is going to prevent the need for you to instantly kind of mix it with a pasta spoon. Um, this is instantly going to kind of get all of your pasta from touching the bottom of the um, pan. Um, so again, we're just going to throw these in for like a couple minutes until they're done boiling. And with the pasta water moving, it's a lot easier to see where these are going. And so that they are getting stuck, or they're getting separated. They're not just sticking in together as one big pasta clump. Um, and you can do these in pretty small batches. Um, this isn't going to be the same way you're used to throwing all of your pasta in with dry pasta. Um, again, this really quickly started to float to the top. Um, and with this, we're going straight into marinara. Um, so this, again, it started to boil. Um, you don't want to overcook these guys, especially if you like more of an al dente. And you can just throw it right back into the bowl or right onto your serving plate. Um, either is fine. But again, you saw how quickly that all boiled. So I'm going to move on to the next batch. And feel free to continue stirring. I mean, the spinning the water trick helps a little, but um, you'll notice with big, big chunks sometimes that they don't um, separate as easily into the pasta water. But that's cooking. And I'm actually, just while we're here, a lot of people do this. This isn't required. We're going to save some of the pasta water, but I'm going to use some of the marinara sauce we have already um, to go with our fresh pasta. Uh, just so we prepare at least a little enough for a plate or two. This keeps the pasta from sticking. Um, it's another trick to prevent that really tough like pasta that you get. Um, but again, we're seeing the pasta's floating now. Um, so this is a great time to take it out. And it might even absorb some of the liquid from the marinara. So don't be afraid if you think they aren't cooked enough. Um, this is a really, really simple and pretty forgiving option. So I'm just gonna finish the fresh dough that we have here. Oops. 
And well, that's going. I'm going to ask Megan if she can start heating up a little bit of olive oil. Um, this is going to be for the Dora Uh We're going to throw them right in from the pot into some oil um, and try to get a little bit of a skin, a little crispiness on that pasta. Mary, how do you want this? Uh, this is a low temperature. Okay. Um, I always, almost, like, almost always, will start garlic slower. Um, I know a lot of recipes will say, especially for onions, wait for the, the oil to be a little hotter before you add your vegetables. Um, but I find with garlic, it's very, very heat sensitive, sensitive, and it's very easy to burn. And once you reach that burn point, there's not much going back. Um, it's usually early enough where you can just restart the dish. And I would recommend if you ever make that mistake, just start again from scratch. Burnt garlic is one of the worst flavors to get out of a dish. Um, but start low uh, until you start to see the garlic start to sizzle. Um, and again, like we did earlier, if it's a little bit too hot, you can cool the oil down by adding room temperature oil. So Megan just added a good handful of oil. Uh, we're not going to measure here. This is a pretty simple um, recipe. And she can actually add the garlic right now. Um, even before the oil is hot, we're just going to throw it in because this is really just to take the heat out of the garlic and flavor this oil. And we're almost done with all the long pasta. Just making sure, especially since we cut it in this poorly cut method, this boutique pasta sometimes will stick to itself. Um, so it's good just to like kind of monitor it, make sure you're not creating those big clumps of dough. Um, if you're using a pasta machine, this is much finer, much more um, synchronous or much more um, organized. Yes, and it just makes the process a little bit easier. But this pasta is ready now. And we're gonna get ready for the other pasta because we're waiting for the olive oil and the garlic to cook. But we prepared a lot of these shows in advance. But some of them got deformed because was, again, I didn't wait long enough for the pasta to dry. So you'll see some of the bows aren't as pretty as they used to be. And they've kind of melded into their own. And these are still going to taste really good, but they're going to be great with a little olive oil and garlic. Uh, we're going to toss some marinara on this as well. Um, but don't be afraid, don't be fussy. Um, this is a difficult technique to get down, but it's a really fun pasta night that you need like no tools for. All you need is semolina flour and water. So it's something great to buy in bulk or buy from your grocery store because most hold them or keep them and keep it in your pantry until you have these types of pasta nights. Um, we're going to same thing. These only cook for about two minutes. Um, and the frying time is a lot more forgiving. <laughs> Definitely don't pick up fresh pasta off the ground. This is one of the things that I wouldn't do <laughs> a second rule on. <laughs> Uh, but be careful when you're dropping this in. If you've cooked a lot in your life, you probably have a lot of burns on your hands like me. Um, and your heat sensitivity is pretty high. Um, but be careful, you are putting these into boiling water. Um, if you really want to be more safe, you can put your pasta into the pasta strainer itself and then kind of dip them in. Um, but again, these are going to sink pretty quickly. Um, and these do need to cook longer than the fresh pasta, um, but still only about two minutes. Um, and the telltale sign is going to be when they float. Um, we'll take them out of the water, put them into the olive oil and garlic. And that is the garlic's looking great. Um, just give them a little stir. Make sure they're ready. And again, the pasta cooking time is pretty particular. Once they're floating, if you leave them in longer, they're going to get really tough and too chewy. You're not really going to enjoy the pasta. Um, but they have a lot more flexibility in the fry pan when you're coating the outsides and crisping them up. Um, so really focus more on this step. You can let more than one batch go into the olive oil. Don't mind that, you know, just 
Making sure Megan's kitchen is up to standards. <laughs> Okay, I think it's been about a minute and a half. They haven't floated yet, so I'm still giving them some more time. Um, while I grab my other guys. While this is ready, this for plates? Yep. We are ready to plate our regular pasta. <laughs> so this is fun to use with tongs if you have them. And by that, Megan, do you have Yeah, them? I do. <laughs> Um, and to create a little bird's nest, if you can, on the plate. Um, this is what you'll see in a lot of fancier restaurants. Um, just grab the pasta, make sure you have a good hand on a chunk of pasta. And then, again, these, some of them actually have stuck together a little bit because I've sat it without any liquid. So this is when I'm gonna go into the pasta water itself. Using the mug, I never have to touch the water um, using the handle. And I have that fresh pasta water to put on that dough. But these may have been because I made them in advance and didn't do them correctly. But it has been over two minutes, so I'm going to take them out now. They haven't floated to the top. And just be careful when you're adding these into the water, or into the oil. Um, Anytime you mix water and hot oil, it's going to react pretty chaotically. So just make sure you're being careful. These pasta ladles are really, really helpful. Um, it really eliminates the need for that strainer. Um, and then if you want, just make sure you're getting them coated in the oil quickly. As soon as you have a little oil on the outside, you'll be good. Um, they're not going to stick. And if you have a non-stick, I mean, feel free to use that. Um, this part's really up to you. And at this point, I'm just going to salt and pepper a little. Just again, so we really have a good flavor. This is a simple dish, especially if you only do the olive oil and garlic, um, that you want the pasta to have that good salty flavor. Bring out the two ingredients that are in this. And well, that's done. like we can smell it, Aaron. Good. Honestly, we, I haven't really had much of a lunch, so I'm really looking forward to eating some of this. Yeah, it looks great. We're just about done. But again, so this is sitting out a little bit longer, just as if you were straining it with a colander. Um, so I'll pour a little bit of pasta water on here, and that is going to quickly activate and kind of loosen up all of the dough in here. So I can pretty easily, and I know I said bird's nests. The technique is to twist it up right when it's on the plate. Um, but these noodles aren't long enough and they're pretty thick. Um, so where they're not going to have as pretty as a finish. But it's a really easy way to make your angel hair um, to make your pasta look extra fancy. And I got these guys. And then all you have to do is pour a little marinara on top, depending on how much the person likes. And, oh, would you go grab the base next? Sure. This is all about home cooking. Don't be fussy, but oh, you can see some of the really big um, slivers of garlic in the side. Um, and the basil leaves and all of that. Oh, sorry, there's one right here. Um, Megan's going to show you a close up while I focus on the other pasta. And again, they have more flexibility when they're in the oil. Um, so it's okay to do one or two batches um, as you're adding. And a really nice way to make this also, I know I said duck fat earlier was great, um, but if you just have butter and some fresh sage, mm. that, oh my gosh, is such a great way to enjoy a fresh pasta. You know, it's really common with gnocchi. Uh, you get that really good crispiness. And also, if you have some cheese you want to be adding into this, 
Um, feel free to add it now or add it right on top as a garnish. But we'll give these guys another little stir. And another one of my favorite chefs online, her name is Alyssa Roman. Totally Google her and look up her videos. Um, she has a rule of thumb of you add salt and pepper every time you add an ingredient. And I really noticed that helps me manage the spice and the salt level a little bit better. Um, just to be adding it every single step, um, a little at a time instead of a bulk in the beginning or a bulk at the end. Um, it kind of really builds a deeper flavor. And with that, oh, we actually have a few more. Let's throw these in. This is from the fresh dough we made today. And something that's helpful when you're braiding these pastas, um, throw a little flour on the table. So when you're finished with it, they will have that flour on it and you can pick them up easier, but they just dissolve right into the water. Well, we'll let these guys go. Anyway, I'll do this. Um, for garnish, Megan's just gonna pick up a couple um, leaves of basil. <laughs> and just put them right on top. Um, feel free if you'd like to, I know these aren't the prettiest. This is winter again, we, we don't have fresh, fresh basil coming in. Um, what I like to do sometimes is if you have like the top of some basil, um, pinch it and it creates like a little flower. I know this is pretty weak basil, but um, that's a really cute um, piece of basil you can put in the center of a dish. And don't be afraid to drizzle a little olive oil on top. If you have Parmesan cheese or Pecorino, or Pecorino Romano cheese, um, this, this turns out great. But this is just a really fun way to make some pasta. And actually, can you bring the camera over here so they see? So this is what you're really looking for when you make the dough. Um, they're starting to float right to the top. Um, so these are the ones we made fresh right before um, coming in. You can see they're a little bit lighter in color as well. Mm -hmm. But just to make sure you don't mess up the pasta if you're making it in advance. I got it a little. But let these fry for just a second longer and we'll be ready with this one. Annie, I saw that we had another um, raffle winner. Would you like to announce? Yes, Olivia. Great. Ooh, congrats, Olivia. Another winner. You're good on the pasta water. I wish the prize for eating Aaron's cooked meal. <laughs> I've had tons of fresh pasta. Okay, and then with this guy, remember, this is home cooking. We're not at a gourmet restaurant, even though these are gourmet noodles. <laughs> so don't be fussy. Um, our family used to just eat olive oil and garlic. That is the most common way we like to make pasta. Uh, that's what I grew up with every week. I started, we had some pasta, olive oil, and garlic. Um, so feel free mm -hmm. to just leave it like this. Uh, this is also great with the marinara. I'm gonna put some on the side just because I like to kind of dip this not this pasta instead. And oops. same thing. We have basil in the sauce. It's nice to add a little basil into the final dish. We are ready. So here is the Lori get this with the marinara sauce and the fresh pasta is over here. That looks so good. Guys, and I know what you guys have all been waiting for. Megan and I will eat some of the pasta so you can see what it tastes like. Do you want to bring it? Okay. Um, so this is actually a weird thing that my family does. Um, depends on where you are in Italy, I think, but we almost always will use a knife and then get some pasta and spin it inside the spoon. These are a little bit shorter noodles, so it's not as necessary, but. Mm. 
This is, I'm so bad at talking with a mouthful. <laughs> the dough is cooked right. It tastes a lot softer than your typical hard boiled, like hard pasta. The marinara sauce is great. I might add a little bit more salt to this. That's the one thing I'd say to salt, to taste the salt before you're done. Um, that was delicious. The basil comes through. You don't have any fish flavor, but it's a really deep, flavorful sauce. And then, mm. so Laura get that are a lot chewier, and the flavor is really, really good. Oh. Sorry. Were you guys able to hear me over there? Oh yeah, we could hear you. Yeah. We could hear you chomping away on that delicious uh -huh. pasta. Well, I just want to say as we're wrapping up, thank you so, so much to everyone who attended our cooking program today. We're very excited you were here. And thank you to Megan for sharing her beautiful new kitchen with us and having Chef Aaron cook. Thank you, Elena, for joining us from Rome, Italy. How lucky were we to hear about fun facts and foodie tips. Oh, thanks and, for having me. Yes, and again, Chef Aaron, you were a real pro today. You were amazing and fabulous. And you didn't scare us with these this cooking, um, class. It seems like something I think I might even try. So thank you so much. It was really, really fabulous. Of course. Thank you guys all for joining. This has been fun and hopefully you take some of the tips that you learned today and use it in your own cooking at home. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you.